Fort Knox, Kentucky. And while most people might prefer to play a round of golf, some tank fanatics are playing with their favorite toys. I, I can't see owning one if I can't take it out and play with it and run it. I, I don't collect anything that I can't shoot or I can't run. This is John Shoup. He's a civilian and this is his hobby. John owns two M5A1 Stewart tanks worth over $100,000. Beautiful. A machine gun enthusiast from Missouri, John has brought his tanks to Fort Knox for a weekend of war games. Never know when you might need your trusty shotgun. John is 51 years old, and he just loves his tanks. He's part of the 14th Armored Division, a group of civilian hobbyists whose idea of fun is to blast thousands of shells at each other. In that area. You need to, to fight from that area, to die in that area, and once the tank stops... John and his buddies carry out battle reenactments every couple of months, but big events like this only take place twice a year. Some reenactors like to play the Allies, and others the Nazis. To make it feel real, some of the Nazis have even learned German. This is a big operation. Seven different groups have turned up with nearly 300 individuals and 10 armored vehicles. Some have come from as far away as California. Anyone can come and play, as long as they have a tank or some other suitable military hardware like a M5A1. The M5A1 Stewart is a lightweight and fast tank, armed with a 37mm main gun and three 30 caliber machine guns. They were used by Patton's Third Army after the Normandy landings and achieved great success in North Africa during the desert campaign against Rommel. John might own two of the 14th Armored Division's tanks, but the man who maintains them is excitable tank nut Tim Garrett. Hey, you stupid gun for nothing! Look what you're doing! Tim's also the platoon leader and will be in charge of the unit's four tanks in battle. This is no cheap hobby. Today's battle involves over a million dollars worth of vintage hardware. And it's not like they can drive down to the local auto repair shop to fix a fender if they have a crash. Right, I control the whole unit as much as I can in order to ensure that we don't have difficulties with the tanks doing anything unrealistic or more importantly unsafe. We've never run one tank into another. We don't know what it would do, but it couldn't be good. Uh, I'm responsible for a lot of the guns because I own them and I maintain them. So if they, and, and a lot of the guys in our unit are not gun guys. We're going to go hot here for a second. Okay, that took care of that one. This is a serious business, and wives and partners have to learn to join the party or get used to being home alone. Uh, this is my wife, Pam. She's operated in the loader position, the bow gunner position, and the driver position of the tank. She's fully qualified. She knows how to operate the radios and the intercoms, and she mechanics with us every Tuesday night on tank night. Most help I do with the mechanics is just mostly hand tools, clean things. I haven't run into another woman that can handle a machine gun quite like Pam. There are times when I call her for help when my machine gun won't operate properly because she's better at breaking them down than a lot of the people that I've met. Now that's true love. Okay, stand by. For John, his tanks are more than museum pieces. Fire and hole. There's the guys that restore these things to just the ultimate detail. Uh, those guys will not bring their vehicles out and run on an event like this. They look pretty good, um, they sit static, they never run, and so consequently they, they, they're not able to run like we do. And then there's the utility guys, we're, we're utility guys. We restore them, we get them to as close as we can possibly get uh, to being absolutely correct, they're mechanically sound, and we can actually take them out and run them and run them hard. And, and we use them like they did in World War II. when the engines get running and everybody's ready to go. Here we go. Let's get it. 
getting ready to rumble. The war has begun. Mock battles can still be a deadly game. Although they're not using live rounds, the blast from a blank fired from the M5A1's cannon can cause severe burns. There are always medics on hand, and fortunately for the 14th, they've never had an accident. This is not exactly your average day out. This is all about noise, smoke, and guns. The 14th Armored Division is taking on a sizable German force, which includes a powerful tank destroyer, the Hetzer. The reenactment will play out like a real battle. The M5A1s deploy on a reconnaissance mission to locate the German armor. Ah, there he is. He's in the woods. The strategy is simple. A full-scale assault followed by a mop-up exercise. But things don't go to plan. The first blood goes to the Germans. Their superior firepower takes out an American armored vehicle. And worse, the M5A1s are being outgunned by the German Hetzer and are forced to regroup. Let's go! Let's go! Let's go! Back her up, Mike. Straight on. Right to sweep the bunker and the tree line. Over. Safely out of the Hetzer's range, John orders the 14th to outflank the German armor. We're going to be lead tank now, Mike, so you just take the lead and go with it. You know where to go. In one last attack, the 14th Armored Division uses their speed to outmaneuver the slower Hetzer. Staggering 30,000 rounds of ammo later, and the 14th Armored Division is victorious. Pretty much accomplished our mission at this point. War games don't come cheap. The 14th Armored spent around $28,000 on this event alone. We had real good luck. Our hydraulics worked great, our interphones worked really good, and uh, I, I thought it went really well. The Hetzer didn't follow the scenario, no, but no, you know that's to be expected. We put about 15 good aimed shots into yeah. it. I, I thought that went really well. Went good. What do you think? I think it went great. I think we're getting the hang of it. I think it went great. And uh, I just took off ahead of you guys because I thought you guys were wasting time. I was glad that you did. Everybody's got to have initiative. You know, when in doubt, attack the enemy. After their day of fun, the unit starts the long process of cleaning up. If they leave any of the corrosive residue in the barrels, they could become damaged and stop firing. When you lay that gun across a German vehicle and squeeze off a couple of quick main gun rounds or fire the coax into a large group of German infantry, particularly the ones that are reenacting as SS, there's no better feeling than that. That's one of the things I like about reenacting American uh, United States Army armor is that we know what side we're on. We know we're fighting the good fight and uh, I'm, I'm much more comfortable with that than I would be anything else. Tim's a spark plug. He's the guy who keeps everybody moving. He has the big vision, you know, and he's, he's kind of the spark plug of the unit, so. Yeah, get some! And the unit needs that. We need somebody that can do that. There's a huge adrenaline rush because you get the smells, the sounds, and the feeling of battle. You get the bruises. You get the sounds through your communication gear, the smell of the, the shells that are going off. It's all there. It's, it's, it's as real as you're going to get without actually getting shot. And the uniforms and all the authentic equipment bring you to the point where you are there. But for John, it's nothing to what tank commanders face during real combat. I don't think we can ever approximate what deadly fire is, is, is really about facing a, a dedicated enemy with uh, usually a lot of uh, bigger guns than you've got. Um, I don't think we could ever recreate that. John sees their reenactments as a way of reminding people of the extraordinary courage of the soldiers who fought in World War II. 
it's out of a great deal of respect and admiration for the veterans that, uh, that we're even able to do this. I mean, if it weren't for their efforts, we wouldn't be here doing this.